I consider the next five minutes to be not only great honor, but one of the professional high points of my life. But then nothing's new about that because all of the professional high points of my life for the last 10 years have been associated with Lynn in some way. I first saw Lynn speak in 1980 in a packed Rhode Island lecture hall, forced to stand where I could barely see her images of squirming microbes. Yet her vivid descriptions, energy, and enthusiasm lit my world. But my life intervened to postpone my study of her work for two decades. My doctoral study and studies in evolutionary ecology at the University of New Mexico left no time for microbes and cell evolution. But my dissertation on the symbiosis between yucca and its yucca moth pollinators led me close to her work. I focused on how adult moth emergence timing and yucca fruit abortion affects their relationship. During my field work on a New Mexico wildlife refuge, I pondered three radical, for a student, new ideas that were congruent with Lynn's teachings. First, my understanding of the species concept was challenged because those symbionts seem to act as one species since neither can sexually reproduce without the other. Second, the word mutualism, which Lynn didn't much like, is oversimplified as a win-win in which species help each other. Yet that symbiosis evolved from a parasitism, so it is less a love affair than a war between species with the Geneva Convention. Third, symbiosis plays a much larger role in ecosystems than was admitted by the competition theoreticians of the time, one of whom, Jim Brown, sat on the front row at my dissertation defense and challenged me. Years earlier in my doctoral exam, neo-Darwinian professors roasted me with questions about altruism, inclusive fitness, and cost-benefit analysis. My answers revealed that I didn't fully understand those concepts, and I was sentenced to more study to atone for my sins. After graduation in 1990, I took a full-time community college teaching position. In my texts were Lynn's ideas about the symbiotic origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts, even if they still labeled Undilopodia as flagella and made no reference to their origins. Then, in 1997, came Slanted Truths. In Chapter 20, Big Trouble in Biology, she challenged Neo-Darwinians with a righteous vengeance. She called them priests in a religion who forced students to recite the liturgy of their dogma, as I had been required to do. After reading it, I felt vindicated about my oral exams. I literally cheered. Lynn became my hero. I wanted to study with her, but how? I wanted no more diplomas, and I was a teacher, not a researcher. That year, tired of the constraints imposed upon course content by the college, I quit and became an independent educator in the spirit of Jim Lovelock, offering courses to the general public. Over a decade, I developed 20 seminars from introductory to advanced about chaos theory, fractal geometry, non-equilibrium thermodynamics using Dorian's text, emergence, autopoiesis, symbiogenesis, and Gaia. During that time, my students and I twice attended Lynn's public lectures. At the first, we were marvelous groupies, too poor to attend a post-lecture banquet, but sitting contently outside. Before her second, I arranged a meeting with her to discuss my seminars. We got along so well that she invited me to dinner, one of the high points of my professional life then. In summer 2010, after moving to Maine, she invited me to participate in her film course, Real Life. I traveled by bus from Maine to Amherst, then walked a few blocks to her house. As I climbed the back stairs, she shouted from the kitchen, come in, I hope you're hungry. I walked in to see Lynn, in my view, the greatest biologist of her time, Charles Darwin's equal, cooking dinner. Of course, she loved to cook for all of her students. We ate while discussing Gaia, gardens, language, and Tonio's hip hop. <laughs> what is intellectual heaven? Three weeks of daily classes with Lynn, narrating videos about microbes, helping to reorganize her image database, and eating meals on her back porch while discussing the latest work on the spirochete origins of Undilopodia. At the end of my visit, she hosted a going away party for me, complete with a cake inscribed with microbes and a farewell note. My newest seminar, Gaia 101, Understanding Abrupt Climate Change, dedicated to Lynn, uses principles of system sciences and geophysiology to explain a Lovelockian view of abrupt 
chaotic, extreme climate change. It is receiving strong positive reviews because it offers both a more realistic view of our climate crisis than is available elsewhere, but also awe-inspiring new views of life and Earth, as described by Lynn, Jim Lovelock, and William Irwin Thompson, that are necessary for our survival. It is the core of my emerging nonprofit organization called the Climate Adaptability Project, currently based in Waterville, Maine. Our website is under development. Thank you very much. Um, although I participated in many collaborative projects with Lynn, um, my relationship with her was really neither student nor colleague, but simply and deeply as friend. Lynn Margulis retained throughout her life the child's sense of joy and wonder at what is life. Lynn's open mind remained unfettered by trained in capacities of vision, of seeing. At ease with making conceptual leaps of astonishing brilliance, of genius. Lynn's thinking was consistently above and beyond traditional categories and received wisdom. Lynn always questioned authority, refused to hold truck with arguments from authority. I never believed what they told me, I believed what I saw myself. Yes, for Lynn, conventional wisdom was an oxymoron. A biophilic from birth, Lynn's affinity with nature, her openness to nature never diminished. It did, in fact, increase in depth and nuance. Margulis felt and communicated the pure joy of being part of the continuity of life, part of the history of life on planet Earth. Perhaps her greatest talent that led her to seeing and finding evidence for symbiogenesis was Lynn's breadth of vision combined with an acuity of focus that never, in the big things, missed the mark. We won't talk about the little things. As many of you know, Margulis was deeply and finally the most intellectually generous friend and colleague. In speaking with Lynn over the phone or over breakfast, there was never small talk, never gossip. One of LM's favorite descriptors of our species was the social ape who walks upright and gossips nonstop. Often my phone would ring at about 5 a.m. Lynn always said I was the only person she knew who got up earlier than she did at 4. For well over an hour, my only utterances were, wow, can you spell that? <laughs> Unbelievable, really? Okay, so what's the take home? <laughs> One of our last conversations involved her beloved bryozoa. Lynn would riff in conversations. Puffer pond, bryozoa, pectinella, telemagnifica, no dynamascote, no reef, statoblast, symbiotic chromatia, purple sulfur bacteria, What's the take home? Foundation of ancient coral reefs, everyone thinks it's the algae, no one believes it, it's true. Lynn made Ella and Coltrane look like amateurs. Lynn Margulis did symphonic riffs. Lynn always said you have to have a story to tell and a story that makes sense. The presence of Lynn's absence will be with many of us for some time, but as much as some of us loved, love her, it is not about Lynn. It's about her work. It's about the story. Lynn's legacy remains to be woven into our human perception and understanding of life on planet Earth. In 2009, homage to Darwin debates held at Oxford, Richard Dawkins learned that Occam's razor can be dull. Dawkins summarized his view. It's highly plausible, it's economical, it's parsimonious. Why on earth would you want to drag symbiogenesis when it's so unparsimonious, uneconomical? Because it's there. I love that. To see the world as Margulis saw it, to see her story of symbiogenesis and Gaia, symbiosis from space, is transformational. When symbiogenesis is finally someday absorbed by human cultures, there will be a radical, as in root, Weltanschauung, a shift in worldview. Lynn worked to get the story into the literature and to get the story out to students and the public at large, to get the story out in many iterations through all sorts of media, not to transform human culture, which it will, not to complete the Copernican revolution, which it does, but because it's true. Yes, Lynn, 
has given us a new worldview, transformational and transforming. It will dazzle someday. Lynn, like her predecessor, Charles Darwin, was above all a naturalist. Margulis stands shoulder to shoulder with Darwin. He achieved the that, the fact of evolution. Lynn Margulis achieved the how of evolutionary novelty. With Gaia, Lynn and Jim Lovelock stand shoulder to shoulder with Vernotsky with symbiosis from space. We begin to understand connections and exchanges of Earth as a single ecosystem. Perhaps of most significance to human culture, human species, Lynn, as Peter Westbrook so eloquently described this morning, stands shoulder to shoulder with Copernicus, dealing the final blow to anthropomorphism. We learned from Lynn that each cell of our bodies harbors traces of bygone beings, that mind consciousness does not arise by special dispensation nor evolutionary fiat. It does not only adhere in selected matter, i.e. homo sapiens, it resides in all earth life. We're radically embedded in history, in our evolutionary past. I'm just going to skip the rest of what I had to say because it's getting late and jump right to this. As you know, Lynn gave countless public talks. In the fall of 2010, she gave the keynote at NASA's Astrobiology 50-Year Celebration, ending with her favorite Emily Dickinson poem. I told you that Emily would have the last word. All of this comes from Dazzle. Emily said, Emily Dickinson said, tell all the truth tell it slant, success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise, as lightning to the children, eased by explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Uh, I met for the first time, I met Lynn for the first time in 1957 when she was a graduate student doing her master's in botany and zoology and I had come from India to do my graduate work. I would left behind a wife and two little girls and one to, be, to come and in those lonely days friendship of Carl and Lynn was a great source of uh, happiness, and also was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. In the following year when my wife came, it became a constant routine of every Friday having supper together and discuss, and discuss until sometimes way into the night. And also we learned, my wife learned, how to cook some fabulous American dishes Whenever I see macaroni cheese, I cannot, I always, Lynn's image comes to my mind. We also recall a trip to the Deer County in northern Wisconsin when Lynn was fully pregnant with a would-be Dorian and also experienced for the first time an American couple fighting with each other. And then we celebrated the birthday of uh, Dorian and many others to come, and uh, pretty soon we became uh, ex an extended family with all uh, the Sagans and the Margulises and, uh, and so on. In any case, after the, uh, my graduation in 1960, I left Madison and she went to um, uh, Berkeley, but our friendship continued and throughout our trials and tribulations, both professional and personal, Lynn and I became very uh, close friends. She had somewhat undo, uh, undeserved high respect for my physics accomplishments, but there were no match to her prolific contributions, to her originality, uh, to her love for teaching, her dedication to her students' interests in and outside the classroom. And, and she was always a source of inspiration and a great help. She helped me uh, completing my uh, book, uh, biography of uh, S. Chandrasekhar. And also, she made me work for one of her class from a uh, video from Big Bang to Planet Earth. For some, for some quite some time, we were both thinking about writing a book together on 
what is matter, what is life, bringing together the uh, well-known problem of whether the laws of physics are enough to explain all the laws of biology in a, in a both uh, conversational thing. But many of our previous engagements have kept, kept us apart. And, but last October, finally we decided it is possible now she was free and also had finished my work and so we were going to work. So on October 17th, I was, I believe, in the same uh, auditorium when she gave her very <clears throat> a last lecture probably, uh, I think it was some kind of a, uh, a big event, and that was the last time I saw her. In the following month, uh, she passed away. And um, that, of course, uh, was the uh, great shock and sadness. <clears throat> um, a celebration like this, at least in the Western tradition, is supposed to be the celebration of uh, <clears throat> celebration and a tribute uh, to the memory and triumph of a person. Uh, it may be so, and it indeed has been so. I have never seen. It's probably one of the best um, memorial I have uh, witnessed. But nonetheless, the finality of someone respected and loved departing from our midst cannot but leave behind the sadness and sorrow. The fundamental fact of human life, Franzen, the author Jonathan Franzen said, we are here for some years and pretty soon we die. And that is the source of all anger, frustration, <coughs> and etc. None of us know why suddenly or otherwise, we have to say it is time to put away your toys. But if, like Lynn, we can say to ourselves, we have done our best in furthering knowledge and in the process radiated warmth and affection, and the simple goodness is the greatest force in the world, then we have made a strong case for our own lives. And we can find consolation in the words of the famous physicist Erwin Schrodinger, whom Lynn really adored. Schrodinger said, thus you can throw yourself flat on the ground, stretched upon Mother Earth, with certain conviction you are one with her and she with you. You are as firmly established, as invulnerable as she, indeed a thousand times further, a thousand times firmer and more invulnerable. As surely as she will en engulf you tomorrow, so surely will she bring you, bring you forth when to new striving and suffering, and not merely someday, now today, every day, she's bringing you forth, not once, but thousand upon thousand times, just as every day engulfs you a thousand times more. Thank you very much. Yeah.